uh, of the investment process. So I think uh, I will try to, to sum up and give some key points of uh, the uh, of my observation uh, from what I do uh, day to day. Um, when I work with startups and with funds who are investing in uh, especially uh, startups that are dealing with new technologies. Uh, and uh, my presentation is, is based on, on the practice. So I would like to show you the problems that turned out to us during, the, um, during our work with, uh, with startups at a very um, different stages of development, starting from the total seed up, so the companies that come to us and just want to uh, establish a company, and those who, uh, who are, for example, um, who exist on the market for several years and are looking for uh, some financing in the, uh, from the funds uh, of the bigger amount of money. Uh, and um, just to start with, uh, of course, um, what I would like to show you today uh, is the, the way how to get some financing, especially at the very early stage of, uh, of the uh, development of the company, uh, when, the, um, when the funds are not interested in uh, investing in startup yet, uh, or because of the fact that, for example, the company doesn't want to spend so much money on, for example, issuing new shares. So what, in what way uh, the companies can find a fast financing? So the easiest way, of course, it would be a, a loan, a loan taken from, from some business angels or a loan taken from, from a seed fund uh, and so on. But um, of course, um, giving a loan uh, is very risky because this money that are given for a year, two or three, they needed to be repaid one day. And the problem is how to make sure that the investor will give this, will see this money again back, uh, together with interest and so on. So um, what to do, uh, the, the instruments that are working globally are, for example, convertible notes. So these are the special instruments, the securities that are issued and given, so the, so the investor is giving money to the, to the company. And later on, at the moment when the company, uh, for example, after, I don't know, two years, three years, uh, will be ready, for example, to, to raise the capital, then they are going to automatically be converted into the capital itself. And these are the instruments that works all around the world. The problem is that they don't exactly work in Poland which uh, makes the whole situation complicated because uh, from my practice a few uh, months ago, uh, we are working with, in Krakow with the Hubraum uh, Fund, which is the uh, fund uh, established by, by Deutsche Telekom for, for the companies that are dealing with mobiles, so apps and so on. And um, they are investing in the companies that are from all over, uh, from all over Europe, especially eastern part and, and uh, central part of Europe. And uh, I have, uh, I, I, I've been working with, for example, uh, the company from Ukraine. Of course, the founders are from Ukraine because all of these companies has its seats in uh, Krakow. Uh, and uh, the boys, they ran out of the money given by Deutsche Telekom and they, they were looking for a very quick uh, cash, they needed cash desperately, and they started to talk with um, angels, business angels from all over Europe. And of course, what they suggested was that they, are, that they will um, give them the loan in a, in a way of convertible note. Uh, and they agreed everything, but later on they came to me and, and told, that, told me that, okay, we have, we have uh, agreed all the conditions, now uh, please uh, just draft the, the, the agreement for us. And uh, the problem is that when I started to talk to them, it turned out that unfortunately this instrument is not going to work in Poland uh, when we are talking about limited, liabilities com uh, limited liability companies. And of course, 99% of Polish startups, uh, they, are, they are being established as LLC. And why it doesn't uh, 
work. Uh, especially for the fact that in uh, the shares in Polish LLC are the, uh, are the shares that are not in the form of a document. They are not released to the shareholders, so there is no document, no, no paper that is given that can be, um, uh, that can be uh, sold, for example, or given to the, to the shareholder itself and that they are not issued in the same series. So this is why you cannot make a preference series of, um, of, of shares. And because of all of this fact, uh, and because of the fact that convertible note uh, is a security that does not work in Poland, the whole procedure cannot be done automatically. And of course, foreign investors, they don't quite understand it, but when you, are, when, when you start to discuss this problem with them, generally we found a way how to avoid all these problems connected with convertible notes and the fact that it cannot be used in Poland itself as an, as an instrument. So what to do is to implement so-called convertible loan, which is uh, more or less the same, but it works in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, uh, generally, um, uh, the, the main difference between these two instruments is that convertible loan does not allow for automatic debt to equity swap. Um, the shareholders, so the founders of the company, they need to oblige themselves to, um, for some uh, obligations, so, so, so they are obliged to do some things connected with the increase of the capital uh, to make this loan be converted into shares. And this is the first main difference that um, when you have a convertible note released, then it all works automatically. Uh, in Polish LLC, it's just the bunch of obligations that are put into the agreement, and these obligations one-to-one -one has to be made to make this loan be converted into, into the capital. For example, there need to be a special separate agreement signed on the uh, set off of, uh, of debts. So the debt of the company is being uh, set off with the debt of the new shareholder. And this is the way how um, uh, these new shares are being paid up. So this means that, of course, no additional contribution made in cash is made, but the important thing is that this separate agreement has to be signed at the end of this whole process. Uh, of course, we also uh, need to remember about the fact that, for example, where, when a new shareholder wants to get to the company, to LLC, uh, we need, it is required to have a form of notarial deed for a new shareholder to subscribe for shares and to uh, join the company, which also means that some of these um, actions are need to be done, for example, in, at the moment when the majority date is, is stated in this agreement, so for example, in two or three years, uh, all these actions will be uh, required to be done to, uh, to make this increase of capital effectively. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what is really important to, uh, to remember is that uh, when you are signing the, uh, the convertible loan agreement, very often some of the instruments that usually are put into the investments agreements, they are already put in these convertible notes. And here I have some remarks about the clauses that you should be really taking care of when you are um, signing this kind of agreement. Because generally it's very often like this, that uh, the founders are so happy that they found the investor that wants to very quickly to put some money there, that they are signing everything that, uh, and they are not thinking that in a few years uh, this conversion will come. And at the moment when this loan is signed, you, for example, especially don't know what is the value of your company be in three or four years. And that maybe you are selling a part of, for, uh, of your company for really 
very small amount of money. And this is something that you need to keep in mind when you, when you sign the, the, the agreement itself. Because what, what is usually put in as these convertible loans, uh, there are two mechanisms they gi that give a special preference to the, uh, to the investors. Uh, it can be so-called uh, valuation cap, or uh, it can be um, uh, the, the, so or it can be a discount. So, for example, it is said that at the moment of conversion, the investor will receive, for example, 20% of this uh, of discount. In comparison to the other shareholders or other investors, they will that will put the money into the uh, into the company. So, or there can be this valuation cap. So, the maximum. Um, price that can be paid by the by the shares in the company, and this is very important thing to remember that um, you need to estimate it that if in three years, for example, your company will rise and will be a big company, that the difference between the price this preferential shareholders will will become the new shareholders, and for example the new funds that will, uh, that will like to invest in your know, company, that this difference can be really big and it may cause some problems. This is why you should remember that granting um, special preferences to the, to the uh, <coughs> borrower may be in few years not so, um, not so good for your company. Uh, remember also that in uh, um, this uh, convertible loan uh, agreements, um, there are some uh, clauses that may be very dangerous. One is, for example, the drag along, uh, drag -along clause. This is something that makes uh, you, um, that gives you the, the, uh, the obligatory uh, gives you the obligation, so you are obliged to sell your shares together with the investor at a specific price. If the investor, for example, starts to be uh, the shareholder of the company and he would like to sell your share, uh, his shares outside to the third party investor, then when the drag -along clause is inside the contract, you will need to sell this money, this, uh, your shares uh, with him. And, uh, of course, this is a very common clause, and it, it's nothing special in it, but you need to remember that you should negotiate the conditions uh, under which this drag along clause uh, is going, to be, uh, is going to, uh, to be realized. Because, for example, what you need to remember is that when the, this new shareholder is just a minority shareholder, so, for example, he will receive, I don't know, 10% of your company, he shouldn't be allowed to drag you when the, uh, when the uh, company or his shares are being sold. It should, uh, it should be a situation that more than 50% of the company is being sold and then the rest can be dragged, but not the other way around. Uh, another thing is that drag along clause shouldn't, um, uh, shouldn't uh, be realized, for example, in a year after the investment is made. It should be, for example, in five years, there should be some caps that, for example, okay, uh, this clause can, uh, can be realized, but it can be, uh, it can be uh, made only when, for example, the minimum amount of money, like, I don't know, you know that your company is going to be, or you at least hope that your company is going to, uh, to have a value at the amount of, for example, on 50 million lotus, and this is the moment when this drag along can start to, to be realized, not before, not when your company is underestimated still. Uh, so, uh, and also you should remember that uh, always when the drag along clause is being put, it means that you should have the so-called preemption right, so you should be the first who can buy this uh, shares from the investor. If you don't have money, if you don't wish to sell, then okay, drug can uh, act. And also, if you have a drug along clause put to the contract when you are forced to, to sign this kind of agreement, remember to, nego to try to negotiate the tag along right. So this time, is a, this is the moment when you are the minority shareholder, for example, 
and someone wants to sell uh, the shares, then you should have a right at your sole discretion to, uh, to attach to this transaction and to go with, with those who are selling the company. So this is your right and this is something that uh, you should try to, to negotiate. Uh, also remember about very, very dangerous clause that is called the liquidation preference clause. This is the moment when um, generally, um, for example, your company is being wind up and um, the investor, uh, he secures his right to um, receive all the money that he invested back first before the rest of the money that stayed in the company is being distributed among the rest of shareholders. And there are several problems with this uh, liquidation preference clause. Because if this clause is, is, uh, is used only at the moment of winding up of the company, which generally is the moment when the company usually does not have any money, this is not dangerous for you, so it's, it's not a problem. The problem is that unfortunately most of uh, funds and most of, of investors, they are uh, making this definition of liquidation uh, uh, bigger, so, so more, uh, they, they put their more situation, and very often they call it the, the moment of so-called capital exit, and this capital exit is also the sale of shares, for example. And of course, this makes this situation, uh, the situation starts to be tricky because if um, you sell your company for not, uh, for, 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 for the money that maybe you are not so very happy with, so it's not such a huge amount of money, then it may turn out that because the, this liquidation preference is, is written in a way uh, it's not very, favorable to you, it may mean that you will not see uh, uh, one slot uh, out of the sale because everything will go to the, uh, to the investor that, that invested to, in, in you at the beginning and he has this preferential uh, liquidation clause there. So uh, please remember that the wording in this uh, liquidation preference clause is very, very important because uh, it may be very tricky even though it seems as if it's, it's not a problem because this is the moment that the, in, in time, in future, that maybe it will not come and I'm not going to think uh, about this right now. But uh, it's not a very wise uh, way of, of, of thinking because of the fact that it may cost you a lot. Uh, what else? Uh, remember that uh, you should um, uh, really uh, be careful about all these kinds of uh, uh, provisions in the agreement that says about so-called immediate maturity of the loan. So uh, very often there are some general clause put that every breach of the contract may cause the immediate maturity of the loan, which means that you will need to give the money back or you will need to transfer this loan into the shares, into the capital. Uh, you should remember that uh, all kinds of general clauses are very, uh, very dangerous. And um, try to negotiate this kind of clause. Of course, uh, probably most of these of this reasons will stay, but you may make them more specific to avoid the discussion if this is this moment when this maturity should come or not. What is, for example, a good way to, to find uh, to find a solution in, in the middle is, for example, to introduce so-called cure periods to the agreement. So, for example, there is a situation that the investor thinks that you um, broke some rules, that, for example, you didn't uh, realize some of your obligations from the agreement, and what he should do is to call you uh, that I think you breached the, the, uh, the provision this and this, and give you the time, for example, 14 days or 30 days to remedy the situation, to change it. And if you don't react, if you don't do anything, then okay, we can think about the, the immediate maturity of the loan. But 
you should always have this chance to, to react, to prevent this kind of situation. Uh, so generally, uh, try to avoid all, all kinds of general clauses, like for example, breach of provisions of the agreement shall result in immediate maturity of the granted loan. This is something that should be corrected, should be changed. Um, another thing is that um, this kind of clause, clauses should be limited only to material breach of provisions. So there should be a group of, of provisions that of course uh, can be named, can be uh, considered to be uh, such a problematic um, such a problematic breach of the, of the provisions that the investor may say, okay, I'm, I'm fed up with working with you, I don't want to, to continue this. And this is reasonable. But um, what you should think of at the moment when you are signing this kind of agreement is that this material breach should be defined. So you should, for example, tell that, okay, when, for example, I don't know, the member of the board who is also the shareholder is doing some uh, anti-competitive, uh, so I don't know, he, he's running another competitive business or anything like this, this is material breach. But not, for example, uh, for, I don't know, not paying your, uh, the, the company that you are working with, you, you haven't paid, for example, for 10 days because, because of some problems, and this is enough to make the loan mature. So this shouldn't uh, work like this in general. Uh, another problem that uh, really very often turns out to be put in, the, in this agreements is uh, the problem who, uh, who is going to incur the costs of, the, of this agreement. So for example, even legal fees very often they are being uh, put on, on, the, on the lender. The problem is that uh, you need to remember of the fact that when this money comes from the big investors, like for example, we recently worked for one of the Polish uh, startups who received a loan, a convertible loan from uh, American Intel. And you need to remember that they have big law firms standing and, and standing for or fighting for them uh, in, in this uh, in this competition and the problem is that um, it may turn out that the costs of their support of, of, of their fees is even I don't know one third of the amount of money that is given to the company if you don't take care of this kind of clause then most of this money is going to be spent on the lawyers and not for or your lawyers but those who supported the, the investor in this process so remember that you can always try to introduce the clauses about the reasonable cost, the cost actually incurred by the investor and so on. So this is another thing that you should remember to, to negotiate. Also uh, try to negotiate the granting the right to the investor to um, subscribe for shares in any uh, next equity financing that is being, uh, that will take pl place before the maturity date of the loan. The problem may be um, of this kind that some of the investors that will, would like to, to invest some money in your company, sometimes because of some reasons, they want to be the sole investor in the one of the round of financing. They, had, they have their own rules of, of, uh, of financing, for example, for a certain amount of money they want, to, uh, they want to get a certain amount of shares, and they maybe not be very keen on the fact that together with them, uh, your lender will also join and will receive the, 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 some shares in the same round of financing. So uh, try to avoid the general uh, granting of this kind of rights. To, uh, to your uh, investor. And I think the last problem that uh, can be uh, really easily uh, solved, but very often uh, becomes a really huge uh, problem is uh, the fact that if you are talking about new technologies and if we are talking about IPR rights that are inside your company and very often this is the only asset that your company has, 
you need to take care of the fact that this IPR rights, I'm talking about copyrights law, uh, trademarks and so on, that you are really the owner of these rights. Because what is really a big problem in, uh, when, when the companies come to us is that they, they start the due, diligence, the, the due diligence process at the moment when the investors come and when the lawyers of the investor come and check and say, oh no, for example, all the rights are next to your country, are, are uh, with your contractors, not with the company, because, for example, you didn't have a good clauses in your agreements connected with the transfer of, uh, of IPR rights to your company. So, what to do before you are, before you will start to think about uh, negotiate with the investor this kind of loans or any other agri investment agreements? Uh, you should. Take a break. You should talk to the or show, show your this, this whole documentation to, to the lawyers or, or the people who knows how to IPR rights uh, should be uh, acquired by the company in the right way in Poland. And first prepare your documentation for for this process, and later on start to negotiate, not the other way around, because unfortunately uh, it may be even a the, the problem of, with IPRs may be so, so big that sometimes investors just don't want to invest money or they are giving you much worse uh, conditions, financial conditions that you will receive if everything would be okay uh, in your company. I think this is all that I can uh, tell you now about this. It just was very short. If any one of you would like to receive this uh, presentation, it's, uh, there, it's no problem, just let me know. I will send it to you. Just need to leave me your card and I will send it to you. Uh, there are some clauses that can be used uh, in your contracts. And if you, of course, have any questions, please, please do.